In the world of watchmaking, the Swiss name stands as a towering symbol of luxury, precision and expert craftsmanship. Today, brands like Rolex, Breitling, Omega and Patek Philippe dominate the watchmaking landscape, their names evoking images of elegance, status and timelessness. However, the ascent of Swiss watchmaking to its current pinnacle of global acclaim was not a journey marked solely by innovation and artisanal prowess. It is a narrative deeply intertwined with the rise and fall of a once revolutionary American contender, the Waltham Watch Company. In the mid 19th century, Waltham emerged as a trailblazer in watchmaking. Based in Massachusetts, it revolutionized the industry by introducing automated machinery and a standardized production process, a stark contrast to the European tradition of handcrafted watches. This approach not only democratized timekeeping by making watches more affordable, but also positioned the United States as a formidable force in the global watch market. The 1876 Centennial Exhibition held at Fairmount Park in Philadelphia became a pivotal moment in this narrative. Waltham, seizing the opportunity, showcased its innovative machinery and production techniques, drawing the attention of the world and cementing the company as a global leader in watch production. Among the throngs of admirers at the exhibition were Swiss emissaries, sent covertly to dissect and absorb the secrets of American watchmaking success and restore Switzerland as the world's watchmaking superpower. Little did the Waltham Company know, however, that the exhibition would mark a turning point in its fortunes and the beginning of its decline. This is a tale of corporate espionage that would eventually turn the tide in favor of Swiss watchmakers, leading to the relegation of the Waltham Watch Company to the sidelines of an industry it once dominated. Thank you to Aaron Stark for providing the channel with a copy of his book, Disrupting Time. This video is based primarily on his detailed account of the rise and fall of the Waltham Watch Company. Aaron has pulled back the veil on Swiss corporate espionage and how it used clandestine tactics in its quest to reassert dominance in the watchmaking industry. A link to purchase Aaron's meticulously researched and fascinating book can be found in the description below. By 1876, the Swiss watchmaking industry, once dominated by artisanal craftsmen in the Jura region and Geneva, faced a significant shift due to the rise of American manufacturing techniques exemplified by companies like Waltham. Barring textiles, its economy was rather undeveloped at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. As the Swiss developed their horological industry, they oscillated between producing Genevan masterpieces and cheap counterfeits for English and French makers. Over time, Swiss-made watches accrued a bad reputation for being cheap and unreliable. However, by the mid-19th century, Swiss watchmakers had proven themselves and become global leaders in the industry. This was thanks in part to the Great Exhibition held at London's Crystal Palace in 1851, at which Swiss watchmaking put on show its best timepieces. The Swiss watchmaking industry was traditionally located in the mountainous French-speaking areas of Switzerland. The industry's rise was linked to the geographical and economic conditions of the region, where poor soil quality and harsh winters led to a need for supplementary income, thus fostering the growth of watchmaking. Families in these regions would make specific parts of a watch in their homes that would then be assembled elsewhere. Thus, Swiss watchmaking was characterized by its decentralized cottage industry structure. While this system fostered craftsmanship, it lacked the quality control, volumes and standardization seen in factory-based production. Swiss watchmakers like Vacheron and Constantin and the Longines Watch Company did begin to introduce centralized factories and the use of assistive tools and early forms of machinery to aid in production. But these were not as advanced and automated as those being developed by American companies during the early to mid 19th century. Contrast this with the development of the watchmaking industry in North America. Watches, as a symbol of emerging technology and time consciousness, were becoming increasingly important. The American railroad system relied totally on mechanical watches to keep track of and stay on time. 
The shift towards punctuality, spurred by the American Civil War, had made timekeeping essential in everyday life on both sides of the Atlantic. While still expensive, techniques of mass production brought the watch within the price range of the ordinary man for the very first time. It was one American company in particular that served as the catalyst of this timekeeping revolution. In 1850, Aaron Lufkin Dennison founded Warren Manufacturing in Roxbury, Massachusetts. Four years later, the company moved to the town of Waltham, from which it later derived its name as the Waltham Watch Company. Dennison had a vision to manufacture watches using machinery, a concept so innovative that it was initially met with skepticism given the handmade and artisanal history of watchmaking up to that point. Yet even with his novel ideas, including assembly line production and interchangeable parts, Dennison struggled to bridge the gap between traditional watchmaking and mass production. Changing its name to the Boston Watch Company in 1853, Dennison's approach involved the use of small machines and assistive tools operated by skilled watchmakers, but this proved too costly and inefficient. His watches required significantly more labor and higher wages compared to Swiss watches, resulting in less efficient and more expensive production without any notable product differentiation. Facing economic challenges and unable to find a reliable distribution network and local market to sell his inventory, Dennison's Waltham Watch Company entered bankruptcy in 1857, yet another corporate victim of the prior year's economic crisis. Enter Royal Robbins, a young savvy businessman already having achieved much for a man in his thirties. Robbins, together with two business partners, purchased the insolvent company on auction. Unlike Dennison, Robbins had expertise in business and watch distribution, although he lacked knowledge in actual watch production. Robbins' tenure at Waltham was initially fraught with challenges. The night before the Robbins partnership purchased the bankrupt business, a creditor swooped in and took virtually all the machines from the factory floor. Robbins' two partners, who were the ones with knowledge of watchmaking, abandoned the endeavor within a few months. Having purchased barely more than a shell of a company and an empty factory, Robbins faced financial ruin. It was his decision in 1857 to employ Ambrose Webster, a machinist with experience in interchangeable parts, that proved pivotal. Webster's expertise in semi-automated processes and standardization was crucial in transforming Waltham's production capabilities. Webster built on Dennison's ideas and Robbins' vision to make the mass production of affordable watches a technical reality. Robbins's strategic decisions, including selling inventory to generate cash, investing in machinery during a recession, and focusing on the machine shop as a competitive advantage, gradually led to improvements in production efficiency. By 1858, Waltham had halved the production cost of its AT&C model watch, and was producing them at a rate twice as efficient as anything the Swiss could make. Despite these steps towards success, the Waltham Watch Company was $10,000 in debt in the winter of 1858 and desperately needed to generate sales. The introduction of the P.S. Bartlett model watch was its gambit. Cheaper and with fewer parts than the AT&C model, the PSB met the demand during the recession for affordable yet reliable watches. Robbins continued to innovate and respond to market needs, introducing the even cheaper William Ellery model, which became popular among soldiers during the Civil War, earning the nickname the Soldier's Watch. This focus on affordable, reliable watches drove Waltham's success, with the Ellery and PSB models accounting for the majority of the company's revenue. As Waltham's profitability soared, competition naturally followed. The establishment of the Elgin National Watch Company in 1864, which recruited key Waltham employees, marked the beginning of serious American competition. Waltham's response was to focus on trade secrecy for its machinery innovation, as opposed to filing patents, a strategy that allowed for continuous improvements in productivity without the risks associated with patent disclosures. The use of automated machinery and mass production had, however, become common among Waltham's American competitors. So it was not just the machinery that made Waltham stand out, but the entirety of its corporate ethos and business culture. By 1876, the Waltham Watch Factory under Royal Robin's leadership had grown significantly, employing nearly 1,000 workers and producing 105,000 watches annually. This impressive growth was not only in scale, 
but also in the working environment it provided, which was notably better compared to the typical factories of the so-called Gilded Age. The well-lit and well-ventilated factory presented a pleasant and safe working environment. Waltham was recognised for its fair treatment of both male and female employees, contributing to its success. 40% of the Waltham workforce were women, a striking example of whom was Eliza Jane Putnam. Like many of her colleagues, Putnam had no prior experience in watchmaking, but was enabled, thanks to the automated production processes, to play a role in producing reliable timepieces. Her wages were notably high for her time, and she, along with all her colleagues, were allowed to purchase company shares as an incentive to encourage innovation. As 1876 dawned, the Waltham Watch Company was on an upward trajectory and it was preparing to stand on the world stage to demonstrate its ingenuity and dominance. In the summer of 1876, the Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia marked the 100-year anniversary of the birth of the American nation with a grand display of industrial achievements and economic growth, symbolizing the country's burgeoning status on the global stage. At the heart of the event were the main building and machinery hall, showcasing the era's newest technological marvels. The main building, the world's largest enclosed space at that time, was a sensory overload of sights and sounds. Across the plaza, Machinery Hall stood as a testament to innovation, housing groundbreaking technologies like the Corliss steam engine, which powered the entire hall's machinery. The exhibition drew nearly 10 million visitors from around the world and ran for six months. The Grand Fair offered a panoramic view of human achievements and sought to promote a sense of global unity. The exhibition also featured smaller yet significant inventions, such as Alexander Graham Bell's telephone, typewriters, sewing machines, and early combustion engines. Among the visitors was Theophilus Grebe, a Swiss watchmaker sent in his official capacity to serve as one of the judges of the watches on display. He was also, however, sent to investigate the booming American watch industry and understand why Swiss watch sales had been steadily declining, which in the four years preceding 1876 had plummeted by 80%. Gribby's encounter with the Waltham Watch Company's automatic screw-making machine, a marvel of efficiency and innovation that could produce a tiny screw every five seconds, left a lasting impression on him. The Waltham exhibit, operated predominantly by women workers from their Massachusetts factory, was designed to showcase its dominance in watchmaking and its mass production capabilities. Robin's chief aim was to discourage American competition, which was growing ever more fierce. Displaying one's proprietary machines in operation for all the world to see was a risky move. Robbins, however, assured the company's board of directors that the machines on display represented only a small fraction of those operating in their factory. With this, he was given the blessing to proceed. By the year of the centennial exhibition in 1876, the Waltham Watch Company in some ways was becoming a victim of its own success. The speed at which the company was able to manufacture watches far outpaced demand. Able to produce 105,000 watches a year, in 1876 it was able to sell only 77,600 watches. The hope was also that the company's exhibit at the fair would boost demand for their product. Robbins, confident in Waltham's superiority, saw Swiss watches as fundamentally different products. Waltham's precision-machined watches were reliable and of high quality, contrasting with the less durable handmade Swiss counterparts that were imported to the USA. Waltham's preparation for the centennial was meticulous and strategic. The company spent significant sums in preparing for the event, setting up an assembly line exhibit in Machinery Hall and a display of 2,200 watches in the main building. In contrast, Swiss participation in the exhibition was less enthusiastic, with modest exhibits lacking any display of significant technological advancements. Overseeing the judging of the world's best watches at the exhibition fell to Professor James Watson of the University of Michigan and Edouard Favre Perret, a respected Swiss watchmaker. A group of 11 judges, comprising six Americans and five internationals, including Theophilus Grebe, were tasked with sifting the wheat from the chaff. Watches were tested for accuracy against astronomical movements in an observatory, a method the Swiss had used for decades to test their finest watches. The results were undisputed. 
Waltham watches were by far the most accurate, and the company was awarded the first gold medal in the precision contest. For the first time, Waltham could truly claim that it produced the world's most precise watches. Gribby's experience judging the watches in the competition, coupled with his amazement at the Waltham assembly line exhibit, led him to report back to Switzerland in alarm about the overwhelming competition from America. In response, the Swiss Watchmakers Professional Society decided that another would be sent to join Gribby at the exhibition, but in an unofficial capacity. A man by the name of Jacques David was chosen for the job. David was an engineer working for the Longines Swiss Watch Company at the time and was an advocate of automating production methods. Arriving in New York on the 23rd of August, 1876, around the midpoint of the Centennial Exhibition's run, David's mission was going to be far more covert. The rules of the exhibition precluded any sketches, drawings, photographs, or other reproductions of articles exhibited. David and Gribby thus needed to go beyond that which was publicly displayed and get an inside look at the Waltham factory, to see not only the full extent of the machinery it operated, but also to understand the company's culture and management systems, which they believed were key to Waltham's advantage in the market. But how would Gribby and David acquire such secret information? The answer to this question emerged in the form of Ambrose Webster, the senior engineer hired by Robbins and who was responsible in large part for its watchmaking systems. At the time of the exhibition, Webster was retired and attended as a tourist. He was, however, open to exploring new opportunities. While there is no record to prove it, it is more than likely that Gribby and David became acquainted with Webster at the Centennial Exhibition. Webster was quite possibly hoping to provide information to Gribby and David to give life to what he hoped would be a lucrative second career helping the Swiss regain their competitive edge. The first step in Jacques David's mission of corporate espionage was to visit the Waltham factory on Crescent Street, which ran parallel to the Charles River. While the details of how David managed to gain entry to the Waltham factory are unknown, David wrote later in a letter to Ernest Francillon, the manager of Longines, that he entered incognito. Contrary to the popular view, David was not invited as a guest to tour the factory floor. His visit was secretive and methodical. It is likely that David entered surreptitiously by posing as an ordinary worker, slipping inside at the start of the 7 a.m. shift. As he blended in with the dozens of workers, David was immediately struck by the efficient, disciplined, clean, and respectful work environment. What he observed in the factory confirmed his concerns about Waltham's capabilities and the potential threat to the Swiss watch industry. David's intelligence gathering was not limited to his brief visit to the Waltham factory. He also relied on a network of informants within the company, including employees and workmen, to provide detailed information about Waltham's operations. The most valuable source of information was, of course, Ambrose Webster, who had played such a key role as an inventor of many of the machines Waltham used in its factory. Webster went on to have a long association with Swiss watchmakers following the exhibition. While acts of corporate spying were common practice at the time, the term industrial espionage was not widely used until later. Between his clandestine observations and secret discussions with informants, David sought to understand and ultimately emulate Waltham's successful model in Switzerland. While he also gathered intelligence on other American watchmakers such as Elgin, his focus always returned to Waltham. Returning to Switzerland in November 1876, David wrote what became known as the David Report, a document containing a comprehensive appraisal of American watchmaking, in particular at the Waltham Watch Factory. It contained information about manufacturing techniques, detailed sketches and designs of machinery, corporate data and cost structure information which he could only have obtained in secret from sources inside the factory. Not until very recently has it been considered that David's report went beyond market research and competitive intelligence and trod into the realm of corporate espionage. The statistics contained in David's report and which were later compared to actual Waltham records were remarkably accurate. From workers' wages, cost structures, stock dividends and production statistics, the precision of David's facts and figures lead to only one conclusion. He surely must have had a secret informant on the inside. Ambrose Webster was a prime candidate to be such a source. The David Report served as a major wake-up call for Swiss watchmakers and is often credited with catalyzing a change towards more efficient production methods. 
David's chief recommendation was to shift from the existing Swiss cottage industry to a centralized yet regional factory system, blending Swiss tradition with American efficiency. His proposals were treated with initial skepticism, and for two months David was mostly ignored. It was only after presenting his second report that the Swiss gradually began to accept that unless they transformed, they faced certain death within the industry. Starting in 1877, Switzerland's watch industry began to undertake a radical transformation. By 1882, the Swiss had built 83 hybrid workshops, particularly in new industrial hubs like Biel and Bern. Swiss factories maintained a more independent, less rigid culture in comparison to their American counterparts. While it is true that the Waltham Watch Company enjoyed initial success from international acclaim and demand in the wake of the Centennial Exhibition, it wasn't long before it started to feel the bite from competitors both locally and abroad. For the next ten years, the Swiss watch industry and Waltham in the US made strategic moves in opposite directions. The Swiss shifted focus to the luxury segment, emphasizing quality and mechanical reliability. With Waltham focusing on affordability and being distracted by its domestic rivalries, in particular with Elgin with which it engaged in a price war, it underestimated the Swiss resurgence happening right under its nose. By 1882, Waltham began losing its international market share to the recovering Swiss industry. The next year, in 1883, Ezra Fitch became superintendent of Waltham, marking a strategic shift towards aligning production with market demand. Fitch's 1884 ascension to the board signalled a reduced role for Royal Robins and a new focus on short-term profitability over innovation. Fitch's strategies, while precise, didn't yield significant gains, and the company struggled to balance cost-cutting with value creation, neglecting the lucrative luxury segment. Between 1893 and 1900, Swiss watchmakers like Vacheron Constantin and Patek Philippe began to dominate the luxury watch market, leaving the lower-end segment to American firms like Waltham. The 1893 Columbian Exhibition in Chicago highlighted how Swiss innovation had propelled it once again to a market-leading position. As the decades wore on, the Waltham Watch Company's fortunes continued to deteriorate as it was outpaced by Swiss mastery and innovation. Royal Robbins continued in a managerial role at the company he so helped to build for decades until his death in 1902. The Panic of 1907 saw Waltham face further declining sales and earnings. During both World War I and II, Waltham diversified its production to include military items. While these boosted profits, they ultimately distracted from its core watchmaking business. Waltham fared no better in the interwar years, with creditors taking control of the struggling company in 1921. The emergence of wristwatches, rapidly adopted by the Swiss but initially ignored by Waltham, further exposed their strategic missteps. The post-World War II influx of Swiss watches into the American market proved the final nail in its coffin, with the Waltham Watch Company declaring bankruptcy in 1948. For the next few decades, the factory continued to manufacture watches and timepieces, and the Waltham brand was bought, sold, and licensed by various other companies. In 1954, Waltham established a Swiss subsidiary, Waltham International S.A., this company retained the rights to the Waltham brand outside of the USA, primarily manufacturing high-end watches for the Japanese market. Today, the Waltham brand is seeing somewhat of a resurgence, with new models available to purchase through a company with a Swiss-based online store. After the success that was the centennial exhibition for the Waltham Watch Company, few could have foreseen the reversal of fortune that would ultimately befall it. In hindsight, the David Report heralded the beginning of the end of a proud American company. While the Waltham brand lives on, it is but a shadow of a shade of its former glory and has faded almost entirely from the public consciousness. The David Report reads as a prime example of a well-executed corporate spying job. The report was for years treated as highly confidential, with only a few handwritten copies in circulation. For the next 112 years, the report was kept hidden by the Swiss, for fear that it would lead to claims of corporate espionage. It was only in 1992 that the public came to know of the report after it was published by Longines. 
Had Theophilus Gribby and Jacques David not made the trip across the Atlantic some 140 years ago, one wonders whether Waltham's fate would have been any different. Whatever that answer may be, in the combat of industry, the Swiss emerged victorious.